Welcome to our newsroom. This is Rocky Forest reporting. We have a conflict, a debate going on. There was a man who was healed, he was blind, now he can see. The neighbors are debating whether it's the same man. Some say it is, some say it isn't. We're going to have to talk to him to find out if he is the man who was blind. So we'll have to get back to you on the other side of worship. So see you in worship. Good morning. Our call to worship is printed in the bulletin. It will also be up on the screen. I invite you to follow along with the bold print. The Lord be with you. In our own lives. In our homes and houses. In our work. In our community. In our nation we seek and in our world. We seek, for seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and it will be given to you. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, may we have eyes to see you and ears to hear you. Shine in the world today. Shield and portion be. 
Let's pray. Gracious God, maker of heaven and earth, we come to you with praise and thanksgiving this morning. We thank you that you have rescued us through your son, Jesus Christ, who is the true light of life. We thank you that you give us things to remind us of this truth, like the bright shining sun that we have this morning. Help us to remember that you are the source of all light, that you have stepped down into this world to illuminate our darkness. Help us not just to see the light that is you, but to see everything by it. Prepare our hearts, Lord, to let you Show us what is true. 
Amen. Our prayer of confession is printed in the bulletin, and it will also be up on the screen. I invite you to follow along. God of compassion, in Jesus Christ we behold your transforming light, yet we continue to live in darkness. Preoccupied with ourselves, we fail to see your work in the world. We speak when we should listen. We act when we should reflect. Empower us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of him who is the light of the world. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hear the good news. The true light which enlightens everyone has come into the world. And to all who have received him, who have believed in his name, he has given the power to become children of God. Born not of the flesh, nor of man, but of God. Let us believe this good news that in Jesus Christ, God has conquered the darkness of sin and brought us to himself as his own children. We are born again to live a true life in him. Amen. Let's join together in singing, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
So I have a flashlight. What kinds of things might we do with a flashlight? Any ideas? I'm shining on the ceiling. Isn't that cool? You can drive a cat crazy, I understand, with one of these. Besides driving the cat crazy, what else can you do with them? A doorstop? Yeah, it's a big, heavy one. Yes, a doorstop. Sorry. So if you're something's lost in the dark, yep, so you can see. Find our way in the dark. <laughs> so, what if I did this? So I turn my flashlight on, and I have a pot here, and I'm going to put the pot over the flashlight. <laughs> Good way to waste the battery. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Jesus said that we are the light of the world and that we shouldn't put our light under a bushel basket. Well, I don't have a bushel basket. The pot works just as well, right? Instead, we should put the light where everyone can see it to let the light shine. And Jesus, the light of the world, wants to shine through us, in us, that all the world can see. Amen. Before our scripture readings, let us pray. God of grace, open our ears that we might hear from you. Still all voices but your own. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From John chapter 9, reading verses 1 to 12. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples said to him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors... And those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, Does he? Others were saying, No, but someone who looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Here ends our scripture reading for this morning. This series of seven statements, seven I am statements that come up in the Gospel of John are all metaphors. And metaphors have a real value. A metaphor is great because like a good story, it sits in our heads. You're not going to remember very much about this sermon because it's what's called discourse. But to remember the stories I might tell because Maybe they're good stories that stick in our brains. Certainly this metaphor, I in the light of the world, is a simple piece that runs in our brains. And the beauty of a metaphor is that it has depth and meaning. It's like a diamond that you can look at from different angles and see different pieces of and get new depth out of. The risk of a metaphor is that we begin to think that the metaphor 
is in fact the object being talked about, that we begin to focus so much on the metaphor that we miss other pieces about what's being said. And so that, again, is the strength of the seven statements, the seven I am's, that give us a full-orbed picture of who Jesus is and what he is about. So today's metaphor, I'm the light of the world. As we see it and hear it in John chapter 9, and immediately we are off on a tangent. Because Jesus was walking along, he and his disciples, and they passed a man who was born blind. And disciples make an immediate assumption, an assumption from their culture, but also an assumption that sometimes functions in our culture. If this bad thing has happened to this man, then something, someone, is responsible for this having happened to him. So just bear with me for a moment here. At the start of COVID, when people got COVID, we assumed they'd done something wrong. They'd broken the public health rules. That's why they were sick. It was their fault. So we're not that far from the argument that Jesus' disciples make, right? Someone's responsible for this. Someone sinned. But Jesus won't let them go there. Jesus cuts them off and says, neither the man nor his parents sinned to cause this blindness. That's not what this is about. And this should give us comfort. Because when we make the equation that sin X led to illness Y in someone specifically, Jesus is saying, don't go there. That's not what this is about. That's not an equation that human beings are allowed to make. And so we should resist the temptation to do that in ourselves. And we should challenge those around us who might want to make that equation. Instead, Jesus says, this is an opportunity for God to be revealed. And we start saying, hmm, really? But let's think about it for a moment. Isn't it so often in the places of our weakness the places of our brokenness, the places that we are not good at, strong in, that those are the very places that God's glory is most obvious, that God's presence in our life is most clear. Because those things that I do well all by myself, hear mine, see my pride here, I don't need much help with, do I? But those places, those times, those moments when I am lost, when we feel at sea, we find that God steps in in powerful and deep ways. But that was a tangent. Back to our text and back to our metaphor. I am the light of the world. So, the man, so Jesus spit on the ground, made mud, put it on the man's eyes. Notice to this point, still the man has not seen Jesus. He's still blind. He's sent off to the pool of Siloam. He washes his eyes, and now he can see. He heads back to his neighborhood, and there's now a big debate. Is this the man who is blind or not? And the neighbors have an argument. And he keeps saying, no, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one. Now, we didn't go on to the rest of the chapter, in which this debate moves beyond just the neighborhood to include the religious authorities who want to know how is it that you got healed. And the man consistently says, the man called Jesus, made mud, put it on my eyes, told me to wash, and now I can see. A simple, simple story. Jesus, the light of the world, had touched his life. But it also challenged those who denied the miracle, denied what had happened, wanted to know what was going on. Because the light 
sometimes is so bright that it means we cannot see. Let me give you one physical example. Ever been to a matinee movie? The movie hall is dark, dingy, can't see very well. It's a matinee, caught that, that's important to my story. And you step out the doors of the theater at a bright, sunny afternoon, and suddenly you can't see. There is a time of the year when the light comes through that stained glass window when it makes it very, very hard to see any of you when I'm sitting up here. That bright light disorients us, throws us off our game, confronts us with the fact that we are not all we should be. I played basketball in grade nine. I wasn't very good, but I was tall. And I thought I knew how to throw a basketball. No, I was 14 years old. What 14-year-old doesn't know how to throw a basketball? Until I joined the basketball team. And I realized I hadn't a clue how to throw a basketball. And learning to throw it the way the coach told me was weird and awkward and strange. But he was right. Throwing it his way was far more accurate and did a lot better than my comfortable way. Jesus, the light of the world, sometimes shines so brightly on us, so disorients us, that we recognize there has to be a different way. That no longer are we going to live with the old way of throwing the basketball, with the darkness in our lives, with those things in us that are not right. The bright light of Christ confronts us, challenges us, calls us to a new way of being. And that's what experience of those in chapter 9 of John who resisted. They were unable to see that they had been confronted by the light. But the light doesn't do that. Light also brings us hope. You may have heard the joke about the railway company that was having trouble with money, money problems. And so they posted a sign at the entrance to, the to this particular tunnel that said, due to the financial cutbacks, the light at the end of the tunnel has been turned off. Jesus, the light of the world, is a hope that shines. Shines in the darkness. Shines through those things of despair and moments of, of depression in our lives, those moments of anxiety. The light of the world, Jesus Christ, shines. Shines so that we know hope. Shines so that we know there is a way forward. And that comes to us in, mac in micro ways in our lives and specific moments in our lives. How many of us in our lives, in a moment of darkness, in a moment of discouragement, in a moment of despair, have received an email from a friend saying, I'm thinking of you, or a phone call, or even better, a knock at the door and a surprise visitor saying, I was just thinking of you and dropped by. Moments of hope offered to us. The light beginning to shine, the hope at the end of the tunnel is there. The light of Jesus Christ shining through others and through himself into our world. But that hope also appears on a macro scale, on larger moments in the world's life. In 1986, the Marcos regime in the Philippines was a brutal regime, and there were people who wanted to see its overthrow. The military had divided half basically in favor of the Marcos regime and the other half in opposition. Both sides had tanks in downtown Manila and both sides were prepared, they said, to use those tanks in an urban setting to shell each other. Imagine the casualties in the middle. The Christian community chose to stand in the gap, to stand between the two armies, to stand there and call for peace. 
the archbishop, the Roman Catholic archbishop was present and the nuns from one of the convents in the area called the bishop and said, the archbishop and said, should we come down and join you? And he said to them, no, pray. Pray where you are. Pray that hope comes. And there was no bloodshed. There was no violence. The light of the world shone and hope came. And so both on individual lives, but also on larger cases, the light shines, the good news operates, peace happens, the darkness is driven back. But Jesus, the light of the world, offers salvation to this man. He's offered to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, in relationship with God. And Jesus, the light of the world, is the one who shows us the way to relationship with God, to salvation that's offered to us in Jesus Christ. CBC, every Christmas Eve, has a reading, replays a reading of the short story called The Shepherd. And the story goes like this. There's a man flying home alone across the English Channel to be home with his family at Christmas. It's Christmas Eve. And as he's flying over the Channel, that that moonless, starless night because of the clouds, suddenly on his plane, electronics die. He has no radio, He has no navigation system. All he is is a plane over water, and there are no markers. He has no idea where he is. How will he even know that he's not going in circles? Because nothing is to tell him that. He is lost. Until a plane comes along, a plane with navigation and lights, and guides him to the nearest airport in Britain so he can land safely. The plane's called a shepherd. Planes do that, that's called shepherding. He's saved. The man is saved by this one who is the light who guides him to the right place so that he can land in safety. Jesus is the light of the world who guides us, leads us. When we are lost, when we find no way He leads us, guides us, that we might find salvation, that we might find hope, that we might find life. Jesus, partway through the passage that we read, says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Which seems to imply that somehow, if he's gone, the light of the world has gone. But in fact, Jesus Christ remains remains in the life of the church, remains present in our world. The light of Jesus Christ continues to shine in our world, confronting people so they might live the right way, driving back the darkness with the hope that is promised, and offering to us salvation. For Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has come that we might know life and know light. Amen. Are there questions, comments, pushback? We're going to sing a new piece. Um, Discovered this piece online. Christ is the world's light. Um, Joan's going to play the whole tune through so we have it, and then we will join in.
Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, that you have sent him to shine his light, your light, in our world. We thank you for those places that his light confronts us, challenges us, calls us to a new way of being. We thank you that exposes the darkness that we might live in the light. We thank you for the light of Christ that comes that we might live in hope. A hope that pierces the darkness and despair. A hope that comes to us in our anxiety, our grief, our worry. Rejoice that he is hope for us. We thank you for those signs of that hope that we see in our lives, in our community, and in our world. We thank you as well that the light of Jesus Christ comes to save us. We thank you for the salvation that has come to us as you guide us, lead us, draw us deeper into relationship with yourself. We thank you that Jesus is the guide who leads us to your salvation. And we say thank you. We come praying for a world where despair, discouragement, and anxiety are high. We pray about the weather in California and pray for those impacted by rain and storms. Guide and lead and be present, we pray. We pray about the continuing conflict in Ukraine and pray that you would bring about an end to that violence. We recognize that we've been praying that for a long time. We continue to pray that that would happen. We pray for Iran. Pray that the government officials would seek to act for peace, for hope. Remember the programs in, of hearts in Haiti and this country of Haiti. They live in difficult times. Give courage and hope. We pray that the government would act with courage as well. Remember situations closer to home. Remember those who are sick. We pray for those who grieve. Remember those who feel like they walk in darkness despair. And in this silence, we bring to you our thanksgivings and our requests, knowing that you hear us. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The John 9 text is a central piece in the Gospel of John. It raises the fundamental question, what are people going to do with Jesus, the light of the world? Will they let that light in? Will they accept it? Will it shine in their lives? Or will they not? And interestingly, the man who was blind, who doesn't know who Jesus is, has a growing confidence in who Jesus is. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, have continual not seeing, not understanding, not recognizing. And this runs as a parallel. The two pieces run in parallel to each other. And John invites us to be among those who, with the man, have a growing confidence that Jesus is the light of the world. Thanks be to God.
There's some announcements to bring to your attention. You'll see the announcement there about hearts, that the hearts community, that's the Haitians educated and ready to serve. So our work with the th four schools in Haiti, they're still looking for some new members to join them. And so if you're interested, please contact Krista and um, she can give you more details about how to join and be part of this important ministry. And you'll also see um, a couple of announcements there about youth, about the youth meeting on Monday evening, but then also that on the 20th, there is a skating party at the, um, at the sports flex. So please mark that down. So, let's give to God who has been so gracious and generous to us. Our tithes and offerings will now be received. Let us pray. God of grace, take these gifts that we return to you. Use them that all the world might know that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in singing. We have a story to tell to the nations.
And now with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, because now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.